JSU Reading Community and the Public Health Center celebrating the life and legacy of Banker Wilder Evans. We had the author, Dr. Martin Williams. Yesterday, we also celebrated the first annual Black History Makers program, which was absolutely wonderful. And of course, today, we are here with the uh, final agency. So again, on behalf of the Coco Civil Rights Education Center, the Bank of Bank Citizenship and Democracy, and also the Martha Walker Alexander Center for, for Research, we would like to welcome <coughs> this evening and thank you all for coming in. Okay, and so we have three men who dedicated their lives to making sure those 
if they see the Voting Rights Act of 65, particularly Section 5, is still important today in this so called administration. Okay, so the first of all, I'm going to introduce you to Mr. L. Sturridge. Mr. Sturridge here. He was born in Grove Rangan County, where he graduated from Pisgah High School in San Diego, Mississippi. He then enlisted in the U.S. Army, served in the military police, while he took college courses. When he was utterly discharged, he became a full time employee. Some of you know this story. He worked full time at South Central Bell in Jackson, and as a nice student, studied at Jackson State University. Some of you know what that's like, right? After graduation, he then went to law school at the University of Mississippi, Oxford, and since then, he's been practicing law in Cleveland, Mississippi. He served on the Cleveland Board of Aldermen. He serves as legal counsel for Bolivar County Board of Election Commissioner uh, since 1989, and is currently legal counsel for Bolivar County. Second person we have is Mr. Mike Sayer. And he is the co founder of Southern Echo in 1989 with uh, Mr. Hobbs Watkins, who many of you know. And he now serves as a senior organizer, training coordinator, and staff counsel for Southern Echo. This is, um, I know some of you have done work with them or have run into them locally. They're a grassroots leadership, development, education, and training organization that works to develop leaders and organizers in African American communities. Communities of color in 14 states across the South and Southwest. They focus on providing training and technical assistance to these communities through political redistricting, helping them with political redistricting plans, and enforcing voting rights, the application of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act specifically. Um, he, Mr. Sayer first became involved with the Civil Rights Movement in 1961 in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he worked with the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights. Joined the staff of SNF, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 63, worked on the Mississippi Voting Rights Project with SNF from 63 to 65, worked with the United Farm Workers, you get any idea, right? Um, and here in the VA in government from Harvard University, his law degree from Rutgers. Um, prior to coming back to Mississippi, he worked with the Center for Constitutional Rights and in law service programs in New Jersey and Maine with a private practice in Maine before coming here in 1989. Our third panelist is Robert B. McDuff. Mr. McDuff is a civil rights and criminal defense attorney practicing in Jackson, Mississippi. He's worked on trial and appellate work in national cases, and he's argued four cases before the Supreme Court. Um, he's represented black voters in many cases, or several cases in the South, working on increasing black majority election districts for public officials. His cases involve voting rights, police misconduct, free speech, indigent defense funding, access Courts, abortion rights, school, prayer, discrimination, and education, I'm sorry, employment and housing. And he also has a criminal practice, um, including several death, death penalty cases. And he's currently representing one of the Genesis 6 defendants. Um, he's won numerous awards, and he has been an attorney with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in D.C., a member of the faculty of the University of Mississippi Law School, um, and works in civil rights firms. He's a graduate of Millsaps and Harvard Law School. Let's welcome our panel. How they see the significance of the Voting Rights Act, and particularly, do they believe Section 5 needs to continue on? How do you think the Supreme Court should respond to this case, and why? I believe Mr. Turner said he would go first. Let me say how honored I am to be back on uh, the campus of, of, of the administration. I think it's much more beautiful uh, uh, than it was when I left. So I'm really glad to be here and to discuss something that I've spent the, the last 30 years of my life working on. Um, my, I call it my day with destiny was the year I graduated from Ole Miss Law School. It was the same year that Congress uh, authorized the 25 year extension in 1982. Uh, doing law school at Ole Miss. I participated uh, uh, in the National Frederick Douglass Moot Court Competition uh, in Athens, Georgia, at the University of Georgia, in Athens, where we had the issue before the United States Supreme Court uh, was uh, whether or not uh, you had proof of purposeful discrimination uh, in order to prove a violation of the voting rights act. That would be our case of uh, uh, Mobile, uh, Mobile versus Bolton in 78 and 82. Out of Georgia, the third person law, we participate in the discussion. And 
my team won second place. And I've been kind of interested in the voting rights uh, since then. Uh, Congress, when they amended the Voting Rights Act in 1982, they lowered the, the evidentiary burden that the plaintiffs would have to prove the court from proving intentional discrimination, intentional or purposeful discrimination, to whether or not to look at a set of objective factors that resulted in a denial of equal opportunity to participate in the political process, uh, which was a result of the test rather than a purposeful, intentional like conduct, which is much more problematic than the evidence to prove the court of law. So from 1982, uh, that was when the first time that uh, African-American citizens uh, in the United States began to make gains in the electoral and political process. Some of the techniques they had used, for instance, here in the city of Jackson, uh, where now we have a seven member city council that's elected by wards. Back at that time, you had three, a uh, three member council that was elected citywide. And the city was a majority white at the time. And I think the first uh, African American way to get elected right here in Jackson happened in 1985 or 1986 or somewhere in that time. Yeah. And if you apply that same reasoning to municipalities or throughout the state of Mississippi, or through school districts throughout the state of Mississippi, uh, board of supervisors throughout the state of Mississippi, what you will find is that even here in Hines County, which has five members on the board of supervisors, all 82 counties are uh, in Mississippi, uh, the first uh, African American member to serve was Billy Johnson and George Smith in 1979. That was after a long period of Litigation in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that they were finally able to get. Uh, Hines County was like 40% African American, but all the districts, all five districts, were majority white. And when they divided up and created a majority African American majority district, that's when they were first able to be elected. That was the second in 1986. Uh, if you look around uh, Mississippi right now, uh, you're familiar with Byron Lowe. I've been reading this in the newspaper this year. Byron, Mississippi, right? Right there on I 55. Uh, it was incorporated a few years back. No African Americans on the board uh, as of this day. Uh, even though the, the census revealed that Byron is, is, is the majority African American in the whole population. So I don't know what happened in the election this year. Today, no African American served in the town of, of, of Byron. I read an article about Flint, Mississippi, uh, where they were trying to have uh, one, I think one district that's majority African American in total population, but no districts that are majority in voting age population. And uh, I think it was attorney Ottawa Carter uh, that sold the NAACP in Flint. And they were in the process of trying to get a plan that demonstrated that two African American voting age population districts could be configured in Clinton, Mississippi. I don't know what the status of you know, uh, is. I guess to answer the overall question going from 1982 to 2012, it's my opinion that the Voting Rights Act Section 5 is very much still needed. And, uh, uh, and I'm hoping that the Supreme Court will you know, find a way to uphold it. Uh, we have not arrived yet. Uh, in my view. Uh, I think that the last election kind of gave a glimpse of what I think the city Supreme Court might, be, might see. Is that if you ask any minority group, or any minority group in, in America, whether it be the American Indian, the Hispanics, the African American, or even women, whether or not the, uh, the United States Congress or, uh, or the federal government has dealt with them fairly, and I think the answer would be a resounding no. And I say that because if you look at the results of the last election, uh, uh, the Asians, the Japanese, the Chinese, uh, the Hispanics, the African American, even women, all of them voted in overwhelming percentages for President Obama. So I kind of think that the Supreme Court listens to what the court says, I mean, uh, what, the, what the voters say at some point in time. But now, what, what will actually happen? I'll let these gentlemen here do a more uh, academic than I am. Uh, I'm just an old country traveler. Hear what they have to say about the matter. Good evening. Thank you. 
cell phone. Can you hear me now? <laughs> First, I want to thank uh, Brother Macklemore and the Hamer Institute for being generous enough to include me in this panel with these two giants of both my stars in this exhibit. Uh, <coughs> I might approach this from a somewhat different way of looking at this. The question isn't whether, first of all, let me back up a step. We're not in a post-racial society. Oh, I know we're not. I just want to clear that. I'm just stuck. I know, I had to say something. I don't think the question is whether we no longer need Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, but why it isn't being extended to the rest of the country. Now, I don't believe this House of Representatives, controlled by the Republicans, would consent to doing that, but that's really what the need is. That was demonstrated most vividly in this last election by all the new devices, in terms of voter ID, long, long lines, uh, restricting early voting and so forth, that were undertaken. These are the classic kind of techniques and tactics that were designed as the culture shifted in order to uh, dilute minority voting strength. So I say this. Poverty is the intended consequence of conscious policies. And we've been battling that since the beginning of the country which was rooted in the exploitation of labor of persons of African descent and persons of, of uh, Mexican descent and Chinese descent and so forth. We are still making that battle today. Now, you say it's a matter of conscious policy. What kind of policies do we have? We have four kinds of policies. We have constitutional policies. We have laws and ordinances. We have rules and regulations. And we have a fourth component, which is sometimes more powerful than the other three put together, and that's customs and practices. Now, this battle over policy is a battle over power. The essential ingredient of first-class citizenship is the right to vote. But if you have the right to vote and don't know, it's the same as not having that right. If you know you have that right, but you can't exercise it, it's the same as not having that right. And if you have the capacity to exercise power and decline to do it, then it's the same as not having that power. At every stage of the struggle around voting rights, it was community coming onto the playing field in an organized way that forced public officials to change the policies. None of this came voluntarily. You have to put yourself back in the period of time before 1965 to recollect, to imagine, to envision what it was like not to have the right to vote, not to have a single person who was of color in any public position, not to have anybody who could go to the polls, even if they were racist, and be able to vote, to exercise their vote, to impact the formation or impact the implementation of public policy. And the power was all confined to the white community. And it was done under the color of law. So the argument was, wow, you didn't pass the literacy test, or you didn't pass the poll tax. By the way, if you did, we might come to your home and shoot it up, or knock you in the head, or kill somebody, or take away your mortgage, or burn down your house. But that's another matter. Okay. So behind the color of law has always been forced to violence. And we still have that sort of dynamic today in the war on drugs. Have any of you read Michelle Alexander's book on the, the, the new segregation? It's a powerful book. You really need, you really need to dig into that because it's really uh, the new structure of separation, exclusion, insulation, and marginalization of communities of color. When we say, wait a minute, now the House of Representatives won't make these changes to preserve the Voting Rights Act or extend the Voting Rights Act, not as it's presently uh, you know, configured, right? That has to do with voting. 
that's good people coming out of the playing field and that we can have other problems. So, what is this right around Voting Rights Act in Section 5? Section 5 gives community the capacity to go to the Department of Justice and say, we want you to review these proposed changes in the law or these proposed changes in the redistricting plan because we think they violate our, the rights of our community. And there's a review process. In the absence of that review process, it would be extremely difficult for community to overturn these practices imposed by a majority. And remember that in Mississippi, there's still only 37% of the population imposed by the majority. You have to remember where we were before 1965, and remember that a lot of people around then are still around now, and many of them are in public office. And if, I don't think, I'll say this, I don't think that there has been a fundamental change of heart. I think there's been a fundamental change in practice imposed by the change in policy, which was generated by community coming onto the playing field and making that happen. And that is our responsibility. We can complain all we want about what other folks are doing, but there is a role in this for us. And no one else is going to play that role. If we don't assume that role, then we have ourselves to blame. It's very difficult for any of us as an individual to have this kind of impact. But together, organized as a community around a common vision and understanding of what the issues are and what the policies and remedies need to be, have a capacity, have a power that makes a difference. And by power, I mean the capacity to make things happen or not to happen. And that's what we've demonstrated over the last it's 50 years, really, in Mississippi, that this battle has been going on in an organized way, and we've made all these changes. Have we won the battle, ultimately? No. Do we have further to travel than we've already come? Yes, we do. Is poverty still there as a matter of public policy, reinforced by public policy? Isn't that what the battle over Medicaid expansion is about? Extending health care to those who can't afford it? Isn't one of the elements of, of a, an impoverished community that doesn't have effective access to health care or doesn't have effective access to the kind of quality education to which every student ought to be entitled? And with that, when every, the House Ways and Means, uh, House Appropriations Committee just this week passed out a bill to go to the Senate, excuse me, the House passed, not just the committee, the House passed a bill to send to the Senate which is going to underfund Mississippi public education by $300 million for next year. $300 million. That's a matter of power. That's a matter of policy. That's a matter of who has the votes and who's putting the pressure on them. And we need to do more than we've done if we're going to change those kind of policies. Now, if there were no Section 5, we have even less power in the legislature than we have now because there would be nobody to review those plans. Ironically, in the Shelby case, ironically in the Shelby case, guess which state from the southern states joined in support of upholding Section 5? You'll see it in that article I handed out. Two of them. North Carolina and the other state was Mississippi. Why? Because we have an attorney general who was elected, who is Democrat, and, and who says, hey, Mississippi has really benefited from the review process that Section 5 has engendered. And that's why we have the largest black caucus in the legislature in any state in the country. Did you read the article about how we just ratified the 13th Amendment? Well, actually, we did that in 1995. That was the first time when we doubled the size of the Black Caucus in the 1992 election. The vote in 1995, to, which is about to ratify the 13th Amendment, was the first time something initiated by the Black Caucus 
that had been passed by the state legislature. And it was of importance to the community. It was other than the King holiday. And what that demonstrated was the capacity to make things happen and not happen two years later. This is about the importance of the redistricting plans, which went through, went to the Supreme Court twice under, under uh, review before we got it adopted. In 1997, we passed the largest appropriation for public education in the history of the state, new money. That was the MAEP formula. And then in, in 1998 and 2000, we had the largest teacher salary increases in the history of the state. Where did that come from? It came from the leadership in the legislative black caucus when when uh, Governor Fordyce, you remember Governor Fordyce of the SUV? Oh, that was the SUV, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Fordyce vetoed the MAEP legislation in 1997. The white leadership wanted to compromise the $650 million appropriation for the Fordyce and reduced it to $380 million. Senator Benny Turner, who was at that time the head of the caucus out of uh, West Point, and was one of those who had gotten elected in the 1992 redistricting plan that we worked on, he said, no, we're going to go for a veto override of Fordyce's uh, action to, to undermine the MEP funding. The veto override passed by one vote in the Senate and three votes in the House. Was a unified black caucus critical to the success of that legislation for public education, which was supposed to go to make more equitable resources available to majority black schools, and especially in the Delta and the Southwest and the East Central part of the state? The answer is without that, it wouldn't have happened. And in that one election, through the redistricting plan in 1992, we doubled the size of the caucus from 21 to 42, and it's now up to, what, 49? Now 49, okay. We had 50 at one point, but it's back down to 49. You're gonna answer all my questions before I get a chance to ask them. <laughs> <laughs>
percent of the members of the county boards of supervisors are African American. That's not quite where it should be, but it's close if you come if you talk in terms of proportion. And I think it really is ingrained in politicians, black and white, around the state that compliance is required with Section 5 of the Act. So whenever, uh, after the census, these politicians sit down to draw a new plan for a county board of supervisors or for the Mississippi House of Representatives or Senator for the congressional districts, they know that they've got to draw a certain number of black majority black districts. Because if they backslide, if they reduce the number, then they face a likely objection from the United States Attorney General under Section 5 of the Act, the group under section. And I think that's one of the one of the wonderful things that has happened with the Act is hiring white politicians to recognize black folks. Now there's there, there are two sorts of uh, two ways that, that white politicians can recognize the black voters in terms of the election. One is the example that, that Mike Sayer just gave of the fact that the Mississippi Attorney General, Jim Hood, uh, joined the brief in the U.S. Supreme Court in support of maintaining Section 5. This is a white politician, a former district attorney. I don't know what his core beliefs are, but I do know that he knows he got elected with black votes. Now we may not be able, to, we may not be in the, in the day yet, hopefully we will be sometime in our lifetimes where, where an African American can be elected statewide in Mississippi. But certainly white Democrats who are elected do get elected with black folks. And Jim Hood knows it, and he knows that it is his political interest to support that act so that he will continue to get some get the support of, of African American voters as he runs for attorney general if he ever runs for governor. But then the other thing is that white politicians recognize that because of Section 5, they cannot reduce the number of black majority districts. It's a wonderful thing. Now, what happens if the Supreme Court strikes it down, strikes down Section 5? And I'm pessimistic about this. I think, I think they're going to strike it down by 5 to 4 vote. We can talk more about that. But what happens if they do? Why, why do we need it? I mean, we see there, there are isolated examples of, of incidents over the past years that show why we need to kill like Mississippi in 2001. Uh, the, the large number of, of black people decided to run for city council. The city canceled the election. They canceled the election. They didn't hold it. They came up with some political excuse. Fortunately, the Justice Department stepped in under Section 5 and stopped that. Um, you know, my fear is that sort of the instincts, the sort of racist instincts, and the instincts to, to hold on to power and increase power that exist among, among many in the white majority are going to come back and they will take advantage of the absence of Section 5, if in fact it's started down, and they'll start cutting back on the number of black majority districts. I, I, once, I once walked down, I, you know, I was in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland, where the conflict there is not among races, it's among Catholics and Protestants. It, that conflict has died down in the last 20 years, but it was amazing, 15 years. It was amazing there, people just on, on different sides of the city were fighting with guns and the immense amount of hatred just growing out of, out of this religious divide and a divide about who, who, should, who should have the power. Well, we got that in Mississippi uh, magnified by race, magnified by the history of the racial conflict beginning with slavery. So you, you, want, you hope that people's instincts are going to, you know, the, the better angels of their nature are going to prevail and that you don't have to have the heavy hand of the law. But my fear is that, that what, what some people call man's inhumanity toward man, first people's inhumanity toward other people, is going is, is to come back if the Voting Rights Act is removed and if the 
they don't have that sort of the, the hammer of the law there. Now, if it, if it is abolished and we see the legislature reduce the number of the majority of black districts or various counties, there still is another provision of, of the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, which is national, which is not being challenged. And you can go, black voters can go into court to fight that. But it's a much more expensive proposition. It's a much more difficult proposition um, than and, and it places the burden on the black voters to go into court and prove a violation of the Voting Rights Act rather than the current burden, which is where the cities and the counties and the state have to go convince the Justice Department that they are complying with the act. Um, if it does get struck down, it's going to be up to all of us to be vigilant and watching for this sort of, sort of backsliding and to file lawsuits and to organize and to and to do everything we can to prevent that and to maintain the gains of the last the last 50 years. But Section 5 is such an important tool in preserving those gains. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a bad thing if it gets struck down. Um, and hopefully it won't. But we'll see. What I'd like to do is make sure you have a chance to ask your questions. If not. But, so, but before we do that, let's draw our next book. Uh, so it'll give you a second to think what questions you have. And our next winner, uh, Richard Wright's native son, is number 501. that I have is that things like the voter ID and other manipulative devices that have been used to suppress the vote, um, I can hear the argument. Do I need to come up to the microphone? Oh, okay. Oh, you need to record it. Okay. <laughs> Because we know what the effect is, 
you know, the intention of the fact is. I just want to clarify that because it isn't race neutral. I leave it to you guys to I haven't been involved in any litigation about voter ID or, um, or shortening the time period for early voting. Uh, in fact, in Mississippi, we don't even have early voting. I mean, I oftentimes thought that that was a bit, um, I guess you could say, uh, coincidental. It would be nice that we never had, you know, the legislature never passed it. Uh, and I've oftentimes thought that, uh, that it could be discriminatory in my mind. Uh, I think that if you look at the fact that to vote, if you've got to have an ID, you look at the type of ID. Some states allow uh, college students to use IDs, other states don't. Uh, obviously, it could be discriminatory in my mind. And I can easily see how it could be discriminatory. And the first thing that you hear the conservatives say is, Hey, you got to have a passport or a driver's license to get on an airplane. Well, if you go to the Mississippi Delta, I can show you a lot of people that never left out of Baltimore County, but it doesn't have an airplane, okay? And, and it's a privilege to have a license to drive. It's also a privilege to be able to travel uh, internationally. It's, uh, it's, it, it isn't an inherent right like voting is. But, 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 but your, your question really proves the answer. Yeah. <laughs> your question really proves the answer. If Section 5 was no longer needed, why are all of these, these discriminatory mechanisms popping up uh, around the country? And you know, the first time out, I don't know how, how many days they had in Florida in 2008. I don't know, it reduced, what percentage we reduced, I don't know. But I can tell you, for example, uh, I'm a personal injury lawyer, you know, in addition to being a voting rights attorney. I've had when I've got insurance settlements from on behalf of my clients with the bank, you know, to, to make the transfer of the money, a lot of these uh, uh, my clients who are African Americans didn't have bank accounts, and you got to have an ID to open a bank account, and, and uh, they didn't, they didn't even do that. So percentage wise, I know that there's a statistical disparity uh, among poor people for having ID, and, and a lot of the IDs, the, the type of identification that's required. Uh, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, it doesn't require that you prove intentional discrimination. All you got to do is just to show that there is a denial and a equal opportunity to participate. And you can use statistics to make that further. The, uh, and the Justice Department under Section 5 has, um, has uh, refused to pretty clear, refused to approve the voter ID law in South Carolina, the voter ID law in Texas, and I think they will refuse to pretty clear the voter ID law in Mississippi. A final decision has not been made, assuming the Supreme Court doesn't strike down to the side. Who cares? 
is if we have the right to vote? Why should I worry about that? What's the answer to that? The answer to that is make a list of what you think quality of life should contain and include. And, and then make a list of what you have and don't have. Make a list of what it takes to get that and what it means to ignore it. The fact of the matter is that we wouldn't be where we are today if the community hadn't taken risks, put their lives on the line, <clears throat> to fight for what, the right to vote because the voting itself was so important? No. They were tearing down the structure of racism of which the right to vote is one of its parts, one of its tools to deny access to first class citizenship is the way you keep everybody under the thumb, under the yoke, right? This issue isn't simply about the right to vote. That's only a means towards an end. The bottom line is that the quality of life of the community is controlled by others. And the opportunity to get out from under that dependency and that culture of subordination and that culture of fear and to create a culture of fairness, equity, and opportunity requires community to be on the playing field. To take that for granted is to let it go by. I mean, that, that, that's the, the challenge. Can you get down with that sort of, you know, challenge about what apathy means? I mean, that, I thought about that. I live in the University of Town, Delta State is in Cleveland. And uh, very recently, it's been within two weeks ago that the state Democratic Party chairman, Ricky Cole, uh, came. We had lunch about the very issue about setting up a chapter at Delta State to get the students involved in, in the political process. Uh, and there were some um, techniques that, 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 the, that the state party was attempting to implement at each of the state university uh, uh, college in Mississippi. In fact, all of them, not just the state school. So you might want to contact, I mean, uh, uh, the state Democratic Park uh, um, here in Jackson. I would be interested to know if y'all have a voting precinct on Jackson State. Yeah. You didn't? Well, what's the voting precinct on campus? It doesn't matter of organization. I mean, registration and organizing the turnout. I mean, but if you're telling us and giving us uh, a first hand evidence that Look, we're having a problem getting uh, college students here at Jackson State off the hook. I mean, that would be shocking. I think that's our biggest problem. Kids on the rest of these, the poll will show that now. Uh, it, but it's like um, Tuesday next week, we have another special election hour for this year's 28 Tennessee you know. And the previous election we had about two or three weeks ago, we only had 88, 90 students show up, you know. And so we kind of projected it probably less than that. So I think we're pushing the issue, but I'm trying to get students to realize the importance of really this election on Tuesday, also the importance of the election of Kansas. Yeah, some of it is, is sort of talking about the, the, the issues that politicians make it, the, the politicians decide about it, and they make a difference. When you look at these crazy drug laws we have, and people going away for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, or just a uh, minor drug offenses. And you look at, uh, well, who, who makes the first decision about that? What's the district attorney? The district attorney is elected. Uh, the judges who hand out the sentence, they're elected. The legislators who make the laws, they're elected. And if you get good people in these, in these positions, they can make more rational decisions. And instead of trying to send somebody away for 10 or 15, Maybe they'll change the laws to to create lower sentences and more more you know more alternative sentences, more halfway houses, more drug treatment programs, more after school programs. And and you might get this attorney who says, well, maybe this person deserves probation instead of a 15-year sentence. You might have a judge who does that. Or if you go into the federal courts, you want a good judge there. The judges aren't elected, but they're appointed by who? The president. So you know, whether you're voting for President or whether you're voting for the, the local district attorney, these things have a have a make a difference in the way our society works and, and, and what happens to our to our you know our fellow citizens and what in some situations what happens to us. And I think you just got to drive home to people uh, 
the importance of the, of the people who have power and have decisions that make them. How many good people in there except bad people? said something about um, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and uh, one of the things that she talks about in it is the way that African Americans are disproportionately disenfranchised as far as uh, getting convicted for crimes that, like Mr. McDuff was talking about earlier. Um, and I guess when I saw the title of this uh, program, I immediately thought about people that are disenfranchised and as far as uh, voting being a, a right. And, um, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. And, and the second question is, um, I guess one of my professors was wondering um, in class one day, should, should the government be concerned about, all right, the things about the um, voter ID laws, et cetera, should that be a government concern? Or is that a state rights concern? Um, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think that when you're talking about disenfranchisement, what Michelle Alexander is pointing out is the extent to which the use of drug laws and the use of vast amounts of federal money to uh, create incentives for police to rack up the arrest numbers in order to get those federal dollars, not only disenfranchises uh, people in terms of the right to vote, which puts them outside the power, the exercise of power over who makes policy, but it also marginalizes them from every other aspect of the community. The, the convictions are used to deny employment. That's your, you know, your box check on the application for a job if you have been convicted of a felony. It's used to deny housing. You can't get into any sort of suitable, affordable public housing because it's now the law that if you have a drug conviction, you are disqualified. And if it happens while you're in that housing, they can put you and evict you for that. And it, and it also disqualifies you, disqualifies you for a number of uh, kinds of federal benefits. What? Student aid. Uh, and student aid, I'm informed. Okay. And so the whole the whole marginalization funnels down into that singular element, can I get you on a drug offense? Which ties up with what you were talking about. Who makes these laws, who enforces these laws, and so on. And uh, the question of voter ID, in terms of whether the federal government should be concerned with it or the state government should be the studies done by the United States Department of Justice under President Bush and other independent studies all conclude that the issue of voter fraud is, a, is an answer searching for a problem that doesn't exist. That's the phrase they used. I didn't make up that cool phrase. They did. Because that's what it is. There's no data anywhere to justify these sort of draconian efforts to exclude people. Now, the guy in Pennsylvania, who was head of, was he the head of the Senate, Republican head of the Senate during the election, you know, that they keep running this little video on TV all the time. Uh, voter ID, check. <clears throat> we're going to make sure that's how we know that Romney's going to carry Pennsylvania. What was that about? It was about disenfranchisement, and he was telling the truth. That was his motivation. He wasn't shy. He was proud of it. He just didn't think it would become an iconic, you know, video for the next two years. Right? And that, so, you know, I, I don't think, any time you say states' rights, of course, my blood begins to boil a little bit. Uh, there are some things that states should do that they can do better than the federal government. Some things the federal government can do. States, the voter ID doesn't need to be done by either of them. That's my reaction. Hi, I'm Elijah Thompson, first from computer science major. Uh, I was wondering, discrimination has been going on for a long time. Uh, 
I really want to just wonder, um, what does the future look like? Like, is it as if we're fighting an endless battle? Will we ever get past discrimination and segregation? As you see, segregation has a new face and it's continually changing. The situation got better, but will we really ever get past discrimination and segregation and you know, underlying racism? Thank you. You know, there's a great civil rights law called Freedom is a Constant Struggle. And I don't think that we can look to the time when it's over. You know, you can declare victory in your home and we got it to continue on. I think what we have the privilege of doing is building a bridge from our generation to the next generation so that the next generation can engage in the struggle even more powerfully than we have. I don't know that we're privileged to see the end. I know I won't, because I'm old. <laughs> but I don't know that anybody will. There's not going to be that luxury. Uh, things will get better if we're on the point of view. And a lot of things that are problems can be altered. But until we transform the culture in a fundamental way and dismantle the structures that sustain the racist basis on which the country was first created and, and, and uh, you know, further, then, you know, but hell, it's, that's challenging as an opportunity to do some terrific things in short. You know, we wouldn't be born and everything was over. I mean, facetious. Served sheriff from 1979 to 2011, 32 years. 
The numbers and the percentage of the Jane, it was just this younger generation was tired of his, his, his policies of um, arresting young black males, charging them these exorbitant uh, bond fees on misdemeanor offenses to get out of jail, and um, a young African American, you know, who had never been involved or beat in the election. You know, uh, they got into a run. The first time in Baltimore County history that the, the turnout in the, in the runoff was greater than it was in the first primary election. Uh, the first time in history, involvement of young people, and they mobilized. So I still believe that the way that the American government is set up, it still works. But you got to work. The process is not going to just fall into that. You got to get out all guys to work. Uh, that's just my thought. You know, that, that the system really works. Um, I had a couple of governments that I wanted to make. You know, uh, Rob mentioned Gil Mike in Mississippi. He attributed that to the Justice Department. But it wasn't the Justice Department, that was my day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, no, we were going to go to Section 2. Yeah, we were going to Section 2. Yeah, they, they got submitted for free money. And it's an interesting story. And, and I'm going to tell these, uh, you know, they got two other stories. <laughs> <laughs>
So he was holding two positions, state representative and, and, city, and, and city council. And they passed an amendment to the city charter to say that you can't hold both offices. And that put it on office. And when I found out about it, and I went in immediately and filed in federal court and got an injunction, you know, and joined it, um, um, and kept in the office for a while. But eventually they were able to get it free clear, you know, uh, by the United States Attorney General. Uh, but they had put him out of office and moved him to being, you know, uh, state representative. But, but the federal court made it really back until they, they complied with Section 5. These are just examples. Uh, I got three or four stories I don't know.
you anticipated all my questions, so I, I think that's a great sign. So the next thing we need to do before we close up is draw one last copy of Richard Wright's native son. Our winner is, if they're not here, we'll draw in. 5110, or 510. Is 510 here? They probably will. All right. Sweet ones. 519. I'll just keep drawing. See, they lose early. They lose their chance. 506. 519. Oh, 519. Well, come on down. Yeah.
him to say that because the thing that he said to me that was really important in that narrative was that he was reading the Claret Legend as a high school student. So to the three students that's left, it is so important to read. Reading is just so fundamental to wherever we are going to be later in life. My guess is that one or two of you students have thought about going to law school. Is that true? Show of hands. Okay, yeah, right. That's three hands. So uh, you can live a comfortable life. Uh, you can do a number of things that you wish to do. Uh, and you can practice law in Mississippi and earn a living. Uh, so think about that, but also as, as Brother Byron pointed out, we need good social scientists and we need students to go to graduate school and major in computer science or political science or sociology. Uh, we need all of these areas. Uh, but one of the things that we have tried to do with the Haven Institute and with the political science department throughout the years is to engage students in the community, engage students in this, in these kinds of settings. So we can talk about issues that hopefully will have an impact on your life while you're here. But when you graduate from Jackson State, and when you give back to Jackson State, and when you come back to Jackson State, so I'm sure our attorney, uh, Turnage is a member of the Jackson State Alumni Association. I know he's paid his alumni dues. And I know he sends a big check. I, and I know he sends a big check every year to Jackson State. So, but it is really, really important to be engaged while you're here. So, thank all of you for being here, and thank the professors for encouraging you to come. Uh, and again, let's give our council a round.